Welcome to the Influential CEO. This is where visionary founders become revolutionary leaders, elevating your legacy of impact while enjoying the ride. Welcome to another episode of the Influential CEO podcast. I'm Stacey Rasky, and I am so excited to have today's guest on because he is such an epic, badass human being, let alone really being the um, quintessential influential alpha leader. Like we so vibe on that, that whole thing. He's had me on his uh, amazing Step It Up Entrepreneur podcast. So it only made sense for me to bring him on and share his genius here. Uh, join me in welcoming Thomas Keenan. What is going on, Stacey? I am uh, honestly grateful as all hell to be here, and um, I hope to provide as much value to your guests as you did to mine. Yeah, right? I, I, I think if I recall, you you repurposed our chat a lot, right? I mean, yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's one of the keys uh, to content creation, in my opinion. You know, it's like, why go out here and create the same once and then have to redo it in other areas? So why create a podcast and then have to go write a, a separate blog? Why create you know, all of this additional content that we push out on social media? Uh, because let's just be realistic. That's where you and I both get a lot of our clientele from, is social media. Um, so in a, in a manner of, or an effort to be as efficient as possible, repurpose that shit. <laughs> you know, record the podcast, shoot some video with it, make some memes out of it, uh, send out the transcription over to, to rev.com and, and turn it into a blog. Shit, if we get enough of those, we can even turn it into a book if you want to go crazy. Not saying that I've ever heard that happen before, but I know a couple people have done it that way. That is true. I have heard quite a few people do that, turn basically their blog into a book. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I didn't go that route with mine, and I, I know you didn't either. Um, but, you know, it just shows you the possibilities of what we can do. Yeah, absolutely. So for those who have not been introduced to the genius that is you, uh, tell them a little bit about yourself and all the amazing things that you are a part of. Yeah, sure. So um, in sake of time, because this could be a six hour conversation. True. <laughs> uh, I started off uh, as, as an average kid growing up on Long Island, New York. My parents divorced when I was four. Uh, my mom worked her ass off to basically give me the best life that she possibly could. Grew up uh, middle class my, my whole life for the most part. Um, at the age of 17, I was heavily involved in sports. I was a good football player. I was a decent baseball player. Got hurt uh, my first – I was a senior in high school, and I got hurt playing football, and it pretty much ended my, my career, my potential to, to play uh, sports any further. Um, and at that point in time, I, I fell in love with cars. I had two uncles who were in the automotive industry. Uh, one was an auto body technician, and one was a um, owned a used car lot and did a lot of auto detailing, auto mechanics, that kind of stuff. And my mom just, uh, her being a hustler herself, my mom's an alpha female, by the way. Um, she was a, um, she did corporate sales for National Car Rental. She handled multi-million dollar, like big deals. Like her, her role, she would go into um, uh, big businesses, right, and say, hey, buy a package from us for all of your corporate execs who are traveling for the year. And, and we just do business that way. So she would go in and close these big ass deals, which influenced me later in life, even though I, I didn't realize it at a young age. So anyway, um, my mom busy as all hell working nonstop. She, she would ba basically tell me, Hey, look, dude, uh, I don't trust you as a 15, 16 year old uh, male alone. So I'm going to send you to your uncle's house for a couple of weeks over the summer and whatnot. And I, I kind of, got forced i wouldn't say forced bad because I, I wanted to do it at the same time but my mom put me with my uncles and was like hey put this boy to work and what these dudes did to me and i'm grateful for them to the, to the day i die is they instilled a tremendous work ethic into me um it was up early it was work until you know the sun goes down and if you weren't dirty or bloody you didn't work hard enough and um I did that for quite some time, but I also got the experience there and realized that I didn't want to go the traditional route in the automotive business. So I've always been into music. I always uh, liked the, we'll call it the trades. I was, was into carpentry or uh, uh, electrical work and, and fine cabinetry and upholstery. And 
I realized at the age of about 17 or 18 that I could combine those trade talents and marry them with cars in the car audio field. So I went head first and fell in love with car audio. At the age of 17, uh, I became an MECP certified car audio installer. So that's mobile electronic certified professional, which is kind of funny because here I am at 17, I've never worked in a professional environment, yet I've got a piece of paper that says I'm certified. Certifiable. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, pretty close to that too. So uh, I graduate high school and, you know, I'm in the local community college and it, it just, it's not doing it for me. I'm not one who's ever done well in school. It's not my thing. I don't like to be told what I need to learn and, and to follow someone's schedule. I'm just, I've always been in the mindset like, hey, if I want to go do something, I'm going to go do it. And if I don't, good luck. It's just the way it is. And that's been good and bad throughout my career. So uh, I go in, I, I start working in the car audio field, and I wound up spending 20 plus years in that industry. Uh, at the age of 21, I figured out that I knew more than my boss, which was, uh, it was fake. It was, it was not real. I did not know more than my boss, but my mindset told me I did. I quit my job. I had $300 cash in my pocket, and I opened my first business. And uh, for almost a full year, I worked out of my mom's driveway. And cold winters in New York, doing remote starters and custom audio systems. And finally, the neighbors uh, kept knocking on the door saying, hey, uh, you're making too much noise. Enough of this garbage. And I said, all right, well, so went out, found my first uh, retail location, um, rented a, a shop, and wound up having that business for five years before I crashed and burned it into the ground. And it became pretty apparent um, quickly into the, the, the whole process of, of owning and operating a small business that I didn't know what the hell I was doing at all. I knew the technical aspect of it really well. I was great at, the, at being an installer, but I didn't know the back end of the business. I didn't know marketing. I didn't know sales. I didn't know systems and processes. I didn't know hiring. I didn't know delegation. Uh, and these are all things that I think people really need to understand and have a, a firm grasp on before they actually roll the dice and start that business. So transition, I close this business. I go work for someone for three years. I get back on my feet because financially I was in ruins. I was 80 plus thousand dollars in personal debt. And it was just me trying to keep the business alive before throwing the towel in completely. And um, I, I regained some of my, uh, call it um, structure that I could stand on financially. Uh, got married to my wonderful wife, Jennifer. And the same, so I got married in July of 2009. In September of 2009, I started my second business, which was Top Class Installations, and it was very related to the GPS industry, and that's one of the reasons my partner and I were so damn successful. We both come from the car audio field, and we started this business installing GPS tracking devices and, and dash cameras in commercial trucks. Um, so we did that for, he, he's still doing it now. I, I did it for 11 years. I recently just exited that business and sold uh, my 50% to him, um, but that was pretty much where I, where I went Along the way, I clearly, I was hit by reality around the six year, five or six year mark of top class installations. And I'm a big firm believer that life altering events force a major shift in our lives, whether we want it or not. And the life altering event for me was my wife came to me and said, hey, guess what? We've been trying for a couple months, but I'm pregnant and we've got a kid coming into the world. So all of a sudden it was like, oh, I don't have to just worry about me and, and my wife and the dog anymore in the house. It's all of us plus a new human being that's coming into the world. So I look at that as um, a real pivotal, pivotal moment uh, in my life. And I'm grateful that it happened because it forced me to really get my head out of my ass and start being an adult. I started taking things much more serious. I started investing into myself. I started uh, self-educating. I started reading more. I started hiring coaches and joining masterminds. And before long, here I am, I'm realizing that this business that I have has the potential to be a lot more than what it currently is, but the only limiting factor is me. And once I started working on me, that's when the business really started to grow and take off and it became what it, what it is today. So I'm grateful for the whole journey. I just wish that I had uh, started earlier, to be honest with you. Right. I think that's kind of the, the, that wisdom, right? When hindsight's 2020, we're always like, man, I don't mind the failures because I learned valuable lessons. I just wish I would have came to the realization it was an inner game 
long before I started the inner game. Yep, sure. So you are a best-selling author. And Mm -hmm. where did that come into play? Because I love, I mean, that's how you and I connected, right? I've got be boss and fire that bitch. You've got unfuck your business. I mean, it's like so so, uh, synergistic. (laughs) You know, it's like, oh, wait, like this is literally like a reading series, like required reading. (laughs) (laughs) Agreed. Agreed. Uh, So, you know, I'll give you the story here. I agree. And I'm not proud of this. I'm just, you know me, I'm I'm about as transparent as they get. Me too. Uh, I graduated high school and that was the last time I read a book until probably the age of 35. Now, it wasn't that I wasn't reading. I read every technical manual, installation guide and industry magazine related to the car audio field. I was very well educated and and up to speed on what was going on over there. It was my livelihood. It had to be. Um, It wasn't until I hired my first business coach and the first words out of his mouth were, if you're going to work with me, you're going to read. If not, leave. I was like, oh, damn, this guy's not playing around. All right, cool. So, dude, what do I read? And he gave me a list of crap to go read. So uh, I wound up going out, and, and and here's an excuse that a lot of people tell me. Okay, now me as a coach, I hear this a lot, and it, it makes me, like, I, my blood boils when I hear it. And I'm sure you feel the same way. Well, I don't have enough time to read. <sighs> I take a deep breath there. You have enough time to read. Everyone does. All right, it's just not a priority in your life. So... My deal was I was still the technician within my business. I'm on the road 30 to 40,000 miles a year in my personal vehicle, driving from location to location, servicing the customers and all these vehicles, managing my crew. And I, I didn't really have enough time to physically pick up the book. Okay, so what's the alternative? You're in the car all these hours a day. What do you do? Well, there's this thing called Audible and audiobooks. So that's the next best alternative. So I started zipping through audiobooks at a record pace. And then I learned the ultimate hack, which is you can actually increase the speed of the audiobook and get through them even faster. So I'm probably averaging realistically two audiobooks a week at this point. Mm-hmm. And I, I never forget, uh, it was a long day on the road. Uh, it was it was in the winter. It was cold. It was like dark and dreary. I'm backing into my driveway of my New York home, and the audiobook credits were were coming. The book had just finished, and the, you know all the end credits and all the, the BS they give in, in the back of the book there. And I said to myself, "Man, that'd be really cool one day if you wrote a book." I literally smacked myself in the back of the head and said, "Come on, man, it's a pipe dream. That's you're not you're not a writer. It's not you." And um, Once I surrounded myself with the right people, that all changed. So you know this because you're you're, you're aware of my story, but here's the deal. I joined a network and a masterminding group called Apex Entourage. Okay. I came in at the lowest level and it's based at a break free. It's it's based out of Dallas, Texas. and, And I'm actually an employee of the company now, which is a whole other story we can get into in a minute. But I started here at the lowest level. And when I came into this group, I quickly realized that there was dozens, uh, literally dozens of people who were were authors, who had written a book. Some of them did better than others. Some of them had multiple books. And I'm saying to myself, like, wait a second. I, I don't think I'm the smartest human in the world. And I don't think that guy over there is the smartest human in the world, but he's got one or two or three books out. Well, if he can do it, so can I. So I start asking more questions and sure as shit, someone's got an outline and a process to follow to write the book. Once I, I, the way that my brain works, once I see a process, and this is, this is why I probably am good at what I do as far as, you know, being in a COO role in a company is being the integrator. Because once someone shows me an outline or a process, I can go in there and just make it better. Simple as that. So I see this outline, I see this process to write the book, and I say, okay, cool, I'm, I'm going to hack it. I'm going to cut the, the process in half and, and do the same amount of work in less time. So I look at it, I redesign the process, I figure out what the outline is going to be, I hire the right editor, and fast forward eight months later, and there's a book. So it was really, the, the, the switch was hanging around the right people. It's as simple as that. Once I got in the right room, everything changed. And I mean, that is literally the success switch when we think about an external variable, because I mean, it is 80% internal. 
And then when we're talking about that external component, it's just who are you hanging out with? Who are you surrounding yourself with? And I love too that, you know, you, you've got that story, like I wasn't good in school, college was not my jam, like not my thing, not a reader, you know, all of that. And then here you end up being able to step in that place of be, becoming an author, which is huge. Yeah. You know, I, I forget the stat because I haven't looked at it in a while, but it's, it's significantly less than 1% of the population is a published author. And that includes not just books, but blogs too. What? Yeah, it's, it's it's ridiculously low. You can Google it. Uh, I looked it up about a year ago for a presentation I did, and it is it is a ridiculously low number. So when you actually – when you write a blog and publish it, even if you're using something like medium.com, when you actually write that article and it gets published in, in a magazine, when you, when you write that book or you write the forward for someone's book, you, you elevate yourself to – an elite position in society because not everyone can say that they're a published author, you know, um, the situations, and I don't know about you, but this is something that I learned, uh, from Ryan Stuman. Um, I don't, I don't leave my house. I always have a backpack with me for the most part, unless I'm doing something just like completely outside of work. But if I'm traveling any place for work, I have, I have a nice backpack that has, you know, my computer and stuff in there, uh, notebooks, pens, all that kind of crap. Uh, I don't, bother with business cards anymore. Okay. Because my book is my business card. I mm -hmm. always have a book with me, at least one, usually two or three, and they're always pre-signed. Okay. And that book right there is the world's best and biggest lead magnet. And it's also the world's best business card you could ever have. So when someone meets me, I, instead of pulling a business card out of my pocket, which they're going to take and throw into the garbage, I hand them a copy of my book. And here you go. So, I mean, if you went to a conference and you met somebody, if they handed you a business card, the odds of you putting it in the garbage are probably 90% or greater. If someone hands you a book at a conference and says, hey, I'd like to chat with you afterwards, I guarantee you, you're not going to put that book in the garbage. Out of respect for that person, even if you're not a reader, you're going to go home and you're going to put it on, the, uh, on, a, on a bookshelf or on a coffee table and let it sit and collect dust. So true. Yeah. I mean, it's been an amazing business card having a book. And I, you know, I just love that you threw that stat out because it's like, you know, cause I mean, I'm in motorcycle culture and obviously for those who know anything about MCs, right? Like there's the one percenters who are like for hardcore biker dudes. And I think it's just so funny because immediately I went to, oh, we're like the half percenters because we wrote books, <laughs> we're published authors. It's so funny. So we are going to take a really quick break before we dive even further into the power of community, surrounding yourself with the right people, and utilizing that to really elevate your leadership, legacy, impact, and influence in the world. Go deeper by grabbing your copy of my best-selling book, Be a Boss and Fire That Bitch, by going to firethatbitchbook.com. All right, we are back. I'm so excited to continue this amazing conversation with Thomas. And before the break, he was mentioning how his ability to surround himself with the right people really changed everything. It was vital to his really becoming that published author, you know, getting in the room with people who challenged him to be better. And I know that is such a key component to scaling our impact scaling our influence or as i always say it's like stop scaling your business and start scaling who you are being and one of the most powerful ways we can shift who we are being is by shifting the room we're in and i know that's such a vital part of what you do too with apex and break free academy but just how that influenced your evolution as a leader so what are your thoughts on the the role of of community because that's really what we're talking about right in business we're saying network and and who you know and all that but really fundamentally at the core it's just community yeah 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 it really is i mean i can't speak enough about the power of it of the community of the network uh it wasn't until i plugged into networks larger than where i was like my home base that's when things started to get good so the, the, my first experience with it was this, and this is even prior to, to um, joining Break Free Academy and becoming an Apex member. I started using a CRM system called Infusionsoft. 
They, they've recently changed their name to Keep. They're well known. Uh, not one of the easiest ones to use, but it is a beast of a software. It can do a lot of really cool things. And um, this is my, it's funny, this is my first, my first go ahead in business ever using software. So I picked a real good one to start with. <laughs> right. <laughs> so get this software. They, 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 the company knows it's an intense software. They put you through an onboarding process and they make you pay at the time. This is years ago. They made you pay like an extra 1500 bucks for the onboarding because they put a one-on-one -on -one coach with you to help design and build out your first campaigns and, uh, you know, communications with your customers. All right, cool. So now I see this thing and the, the visionary part of my brain is like, holy shit, the possibilities that this software just opened up for my business are, are crazy. But I also realize that I'm not smart enough uh, and I haven't, I haven't taught myself enough to implement them correctly. So I start getting involved in more and more of the community around Infusionsoft. So the low hanging fruit at that point in time, they had, this is back in the day, they don't do it anymore. It's a damn shame. And I'm sure Corona doesn't help either. They had local user groups that were free. So Infusionsoft has what they call ICPs, Infusionsoft Certified Partners. And these ICPs are all over, they're all over the world, but they're all over the U.S. too. And they're in clusters. So this one, these two dudes out of Long Island, both ICPs, they host these events. Okay? They don't make any money from these. They don't charge. They literally bring people in once a month. It's like a three-hour evening. We go to this one guy's office, nice setup, conference table, whiteboard, really smart, successful business owners. And we all start talking about business. What are you struggling with right now? So this is my first ever group mastermind that's going on. So we're having some high level conversations. These guys are then going on the whiteboard and designing processes behind us. Like, oh my God, now, you know, the, the integrator uh, portion of my brain is, is, is blowing up because I understand the processes now. I see what these guys are doing to, to automate their businesses. And it just, it went from there and it just went, it went from like a one to a hundred. So I start going to this user group. I meet good people there. I wind up meeting the, the second most influential business coach I've had in my career, a guy named Dean Mercado. I'll throw him a plug here. He's uh, out of Hop Hog, New York, a company called Online Marketing Muscle. So this, this guy's an online beast building websites and, and implementing Infusionsoft. So I wind up connecting with this dude and, um, working with him one-on-one -on -one for about uh, either two or three years. So we, we did a lot of marketing for top class installations. We did a whole new website. We did email marketing campaigns and a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. And he was focused heavily on me, not just top class. Him and I had a really good, we still do it. We've got a good relationship. And he put a lot of time and effort into me. And he's like, I need you to understand that I, I, I need, I need to develop you as the leader. I know you can be. He goes, you don't, you're not there yet. He goes, you have some self-limiting belief that's in a way and you're not willing to accept it. However, I know you're, you're capable of this. And this guy would just push me, always push me. From there, it's funny, from there, going to uh, bigger live events in, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, where Infusionsoft is based, um, I start connecting with some other people and that's what led me to Break Free Academy. So I came over here as a client, wanted to get a little bit more of a larger network for masterminding, not just something centralized around the Infusionsoft community. Come here. I don't know who Ryan Stuman is. I know the guy from Hole in the Wall. And immediately, keep in mind, I'm pretty rough around the edges. This guy is rubbing me the wrong way. Like, who, who is this guy? He curses more than me. I, like, this, the shit that comes out of his mouth is, is like, wow, I can't believe that dude just said that. Um, so I, I follow along for a while and every time that I watch a video from this guy, he starts making more and more and more sense. And I kind of put the, the other crap aside, long story short, I wanted to become a customer. He puts out an offer about a year after me coming into his, uh, his apex entourage program. He's like, Hey, drop a couple grand, come fly with me on a private jet from Florida to Bahamas. It'll be a one day mastermind. There'd be like seven or eight people max. And he goes, we'll literally lay out the game plan for your entire next year in business. And if you follow my game plan, you're going to succeed like no other. All right, cool. So I do it. I drop the money and um, I fly down to Florida and me being as efficient as possible. I, I fly to Florida. I meet with, I rent a car. <laughs> I fly, I flew into uh, Northern Florida. I, I'm going to butcher the areas because I know you're, you're in Florida and I, I don't even want to say it. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I, I fly in, I rent a car, and I wound up hitting two potential GPS clients. I hit, I hit a third, and then I had a coaching session with another client because I just started coaching at that point in time. So I hit like four people. I go to bed that night. The next morning we wake up. We get, we get on this private jet. We fly to the Bahamas. We mastermind for the entire day. We come back that night. So, I mean, talk about like a crazy schedule. Mm -hmm. I come back and not only am I physically exhausted from the, the two days or three days of travel, my brain is like melted. It's like mud because there's so much crap that's going on in there. And thank God I took notes. Co go back to New York. And about a week later, I get a message from Ryan. He's like, hey, man. He goes, uh, I really enjoyed spending time with you. And I'm like, here we go. Like, th th this guy's like, you know, probably sending everyone the same damn message. Uh, he's probably going to want to upsell me into something. So at first, you know, that defensive uh, portion of the brain is activated. And then I start having a conversation with this guy. And he's, he's as genuine as, as physically possible, as humanly possible. And he's like, no. He goes, I really want to help you. And he goes, I know exactly how to help you. And he laid out the exact game plan money-wise hey, this is what your investment with me is going to be. This is what it's going to cost for you to build this. This is what it's going to cost you to build this, 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 and this. By the way, I know all the people who can build that for you. So once you come in, we're going to light up all these things. And, and before you're, you're done with the year, you can have all these cool things. And one of those was the book. One of those was uh, my first online course. One of those was speaking from stage in front of a large-ass audience. Right. And, and the other one was basically establishing myself as the authority within my industry. Mm -hmm. So he's like, give me 12 months and I guarantee we'll have all that done. Cool. By the, I think it was the eighth month mark, everything was done and accomplished. Boom. Yeah. So like, all right, cool. Like, why didn't I do this sooner? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I love it. When, and that's what it is, right? When it's the right people, yeah. the right people. I love it. And I mean, to create that much success and, and I, I want to pivot just a little bit because I love how that I feel like played so much into this next evolution for you, where, you know, you talked about like growing up, you know, you, with the uncles, you, you are out there hustling your ass up, like working like crazy, crazy work ethic. And like you said, if you're not bloody knuckles and, and filthy at the end of the day, you didn't earn it, right? You didn't work hard. And I love how now, like you've pivoted into this completely opposite space because I'm, I'm very much, you know, you're alpha, I'm alpha. We're the leaders that our businesses, our brands, our message, our mission need us to be. And we have no problem leaning in and hustling our asses off. And yet we're both of this mindset of very anti-hustle. It's very anti-hustle, but it's it's strategic action. Yes. It's aligned action. It's very thoughtful in how you utilize your time and energy and effort, yep. and, you know, to get these really, really massive results. And uh, so I love that you are that example of what it's like to be kind of, again, if somebody meets you on the surface, oh my God, he's going to be like Gary Vee. Or Grant Cardone, just like, oh, just take action, just make it happen. And like, really, the soul of who you are is just, is not that. So let's kind of talk about that evolution. I think that's going to be really good and why it's so important to be so strategic mm -hmm. with your time in yeah. order to have the high performance and the high production and, uh, you know, really the, the big ROI. Yeah. So uh, I'll preface it with this. Uh, we call it power versus force over here. And uh, that's, that's a term that's used in, in multiple um, other areas, and especially in the scientific field. But here's the deal. Early on in my career, everything was a force move. We need more money. Fuck. Let's work harder. Um, there's a problem. Fuck. Let's work harder. <laughs> that was the answer to everything. Literally everything. Do more. Do more. Yeah, do more. Do more with less time. You know, uh, stay up 20 hours and, and maybe sleep for 30 minutes. It didn't matter. Like, just keep pushing forward and doing more. And if, if you're not, like, ridiculously dead tired, you didn't do enough that day. Um, the problem with that, and I, I didn't learn this until later on, until I started getting involved and working one-on-one -on -one with Ryan. Um, he, he's very strategic. And we, we've got this, this theory down here where it's, we live and die by the calendar. Okay, 
So I realized after working with him quickly that I was stuck in a reactionary state. I was not proactive. I was not intentional. So whatever life threw at me that day, I was going to absorb it completely and do my best to fix it, mitigate the risk, whatever the case may be. And I realized after a while that that is not efficient whatsoever. So I had these, some big lofty goals and dreams in my head. They weren't on paper yet. Wasn't that, that smart or, or it wasn't there yet. And I found, I, I figured like, I'm just not getting these things done in a timely fashion. Like, yeah, it's, it's in my head and every so often we take a step towards it, but how do I, how do I actually start being intentional and getting this stuff done? And this, this all goes back to living and dying by the calendar. So I had never used a, a, a real calendar, a structured calendar up until this point. The only calendar that was in my life, all right, and this is, this is now as I'm uh, at top class installations, the only calendar that's in my life is one that I don't control. Okay, so I'm still a technician in my business. My installation coordinators, who are the ones who booked the, the work, the install work, the field work, they control the calendar. So when, when a job ticket comes in, they assign it to the correct technician. So I've got my calendar wide open to someone who I'm paying in the $10 an hour range to, to basically tell me what I'm doing. So the roles reversed. I'm the boss. I'm the CEO of this company. Meanwhile, I've got, I've got an employee who's making, you know, forty or $50,000 a year who's actually booking my time and, and in control of it. So it took me many years of, and actually it took me, removing myself in order to clearly see that but it, it was just ass backwards um once i got super intentional and started putting everything on my calendar that's when things started to get good now a word of caution it was a three-year transition for me to actually start living and dying by the calendar to the point where it is today like literally everything's on the calendar today i mean my, my morning routine is on the calendar you know, driving to the gym, going to the gym, uh, waking up and practicing gratitude, all, all of it's on the calendar. Uh, family time in the morning with my wife and the three kids and the dog. It, I have an hour blocked off every single morning from when I come home from the gym. There's one hour of time that's blocked off just for the wife and the kids and the dog. Nothing else. The phone's not there. It's me, the kid, the wife, the dog. We're on the couch. We're hanging out. We're drinking some protein shakes, a cup of coffee. And the reason that I do that is because no matter what happens when I come into the office, I've already taken care of priority number one. I've taken care of myself mentally with my gratitude. I've taken care of my, myself physically. And I've also put time into my family intentionally. So even if the day goes to complete dog shit afterwards, I've already won. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That is so amazing. And that really is such a vital piece because people are not scheduling enough stuff because i mean people, there are so many people out there that i talk to especially these high performing um you know entrepreneur entrepreneurs with with multiple revenue streams you know they're doing all that stuff but it's like the overwhelm the burnout the not leveraging their time is still deprioritizing the stuff that fills their their cup fills yeah. their their energy and then uh, improves their focus improves their productivity improves their ability to handle all the things and really make smart decisions with their time and energy and right where are we investing these resources mm -hmm. yeah hey i want to go back to power versus force for a second because i didn't sure. i didn't fully explain it and i i kind of let on like i was going to um and before my add kicks in completely and i'm in a complete different direction i want to get it out <laughs> But I mean, that's visionary people, you know, people yeah. like us, we have, you know, short attention spans because our brains function so quickly mm -hmm. We're on to the next thing. And so I think that is, is so important and why our self-care routines are so vital because it helps mitigate some of these ways in which we're just hardwired to be so efficient, so effective, so good at what we do as these visionary revolutionary leaders. Yeah, so true. I, I agree 100%. Um, so power versus force. We have power moves. We have force moves. I was living life with force moves prior. Okay, so getting up and cold calling, making the phone call, going in and, and like driving to, to make sales happen, 
that right there is a force move. Um, doing what you need to do, going in and physically doing the work is a force move. Okay, a power move, and here's the deal, a force move, you get an immediate ROI. Literally, you, you, pick up, you pick up the pen, you move it, and you see the difference, okay? Um, whereas the, the, the power moves, okay, and, and I'll list off some things that are power moves, writing a book, starting a podcast or going on podcasts as a guest and or a host, uh, starting a Facebook group, writing a blog, writing articles for additional magazines. These, these are all power moves, speaking from stage publicly, okay? Um, those are power moves. And you need to be intentional with them, but you also need to understand that you are not going to get an, an immediate ROI. The general rule of thumb is this power moves on the low end. You need to wait at least 90 days before you see an ROI. And that's on like the very low end. I mean, I've got some power moves that I've put into play that I haven't seen an ROI for two years. So, you know, what are you doing today? That's a power move. That's going to pay off tenfold, if not 20 fold, a year or two from now. And when you start thinking on that level and that intentionality comes into your life, that's a total game changer. Oh yeah. Cause you're thinking long game over short game. And so many people are so caught in the short game that they really lose sight of a, those strategic power moves mm -hmm. and making sure that we're choosing the power moves at the right time. So like for me, right? Like knowing when, like I had the nudge for a while, like, yeah, I think at some point, you know, I'm doing all these Facebook lives. It makes sense for me to pivot over to having a podcast. I'm doing lots and lots of podcast interviews, loving it, but understanding, right? We have so much bandwidth. It had to be at the right time. Well, lo and behold, the right people come in to my life, into my network to allow it to be easy at the same time that I'm hiring out more of the tasks in my business. So some of the just everyday mundane things that don't light me up, I don't have to do those anymore. So it was like, yeah. oh, okay, perfect timing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. I love it. You know, um, we, we go through some exercises over here. We do it with our coaching clients too. And I'm sure you do. You may have a different uh, variation or version of it, but it's kind of like, all right, you're a high performing individual. You don't need to be doing everything. Okay. And I've, I've got a time study that's in my book on it that basically says, you know, Hey, and I, it's funny. I posted on social media about it yesterday. Uh, you know, what, what thousand dollar per hour tasks are you letting go because you're too focused on the $10 an hour bullshit, the minutia. Right. Like it happens all the time. And the same thing happens as you elevate and grow your position, either within a company as an employee or even as someone who's in the COO or the CEO role or any of the C-suite executives. So what are, you, what are you doing here? Like you, you eventually have to, you have to do it. Okay. You've got to, you've actually got to go in and, and learn the process, design the process or implement the system, learn how to do it, get really good at it so that you can then document it and, and documentation scares the shit out of people and it doesn't need to be in a written form. It could literally be a, a video. It could be a Zoom video like this. It could be something like loom.com, some kind of screen record that's out there. Screen record what you're doing and then delegate that to someone on your team. And if you don't have the right person to delegate it to, then you may have a new role that you need to hire for. But that's just a way to get smaller things that aren't, they may be necessary for your business to survive but they're not necessary or mandatory that you're the one doing them. So true. Absolutely. And it is amazing how, you know, there's all those stories that we tell ourselves, Oh, I can't afford it. Or, uh, right. Like even those who can not being willing to let go of control because mm -hmm. a lot of that hustle and a lot of those control issues created so much success yep. in the first place and understanding like, wait, now I've got to be willing to let go of control and trust other people to do it, which is challenging in itself to step up into that level of leadership. Mm -hmm. And even though you do delegate it to other people, doesn't mean you're letting it go mentally, emotionally, or energetically. You can still be kind of in that, that space of those control issues. But to be able to say, okay, again, long game. I'm investing in training this person to do this correctly so I don't have to do it. Yep. Because my time is worth way more than what this task is. Yeah. And we've got to be willing to let go in order to create space for what we desire and allowing that in. So we've got to let go of the stuff first 
for the clients, the connections, the collaborations, the money, the whatever to come in. Yeah. We're going to let it go first. I agree with you. And you also have to understand that this doesn't just apply to your business life too. This applies to your home life. Mm -hmm. right. So I'll give you a, give you a quick story here. Uh, I moved to Dallas, Texas in September and about 30 days or so into uh, moving there, probably soon after we recorded our podcast, I got this, this big house I'm, I'm living in and got windows all over. And I look up one day and I'm like, holy shit, that's a dirty window. So I, I said to my wife, my, now my, at this time, my wife is taking a 200 hour yoga teacher training uh, certification. She's, she's like, it's like a full-time job for that whole course that she was doing. I mean, she was out there busting her ass. So, all right, cool. So old Tom brain kicks in and I'm like writing down a list of stuff that I need at Home Depot. I'm going to hop in my truck. I'm going to grab a ladder because I don't have a ladder big enough to get up to these monster windows. I'm going to get all the cleaning supplies, the bucket, blah, 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 blah. I'm writing down this list. I, I stopped. Thank God I stopped. And I said, well, wait, wait a second. This is crazy. This is crazy. So I, I text my wife. And uh, I said, listen, you know, we're, we're new to the area. I don't really know anybody, you know, go, go into your class today and um, see if any of the other women that you're in a class with have someone who comes in and cleans their windows and if they can give us a recommendation. Lo and behold, we get a recommendation. My wife calls this guy. He comes over that day. Okay, that day. And he proceeds to pull out this enormous ladder that probably costs three or 400 bucks. He pulls out all of these cleaning supplies. And then proceeds to spend about six hours at my house cleaning the windows. He charged me 280 bucks to do all the work. Damn. So he's up there on a window. And it's funny. I actually, I actually uh, shot a Facebook live as he's up behind me outside on the, on the ladder cleaning this big window. And he, he's in the video. He doesn't even know it. And I'm talking about if I had actually gone through and done this myself, yeah, I could have done it. It would have taken me two hours to get all the supplies. It would have cost me a couple hundred bucks for all the supplies and the materials. It would have taken me probably 12 hours to do the same quality of work because I'm not efficient at the job because I'm, I'm a newbie here. And it, I would have been pissed off by hour three and I would have said, nope, never again. So I would have spent all that money on the supplies and the tools and I never would have fucking touched it ever again. So I know what I'm worth per hour and, and I implore every person who listens to this podcast to go out and figure out what your hourly worth is. Okay. Cause you need to establish a baseline. If you want to get better, figure out what you're worth per hour. And then when it comes time to do a task at home, I don't care if it's laundry. I don't care if it's cooking, house cleaning, mowing the lawn, uh, cleaning. The, it doesn't make a difference. Is it worth less than your hourly rate or is it worth more? There's your decision right there. Now, the only time that, that, there's a change to that is if it's it, like, for instance, I have a very high net worth individual who's a, a close friend of mine and this dude loves to cut his lawn. And to him, he, he and he's, he's a big firm believer in everything I just told you, but he's like me cutting my lawn. He goes, I actually love doing it. And it's my piece. It's my, it's my, my time for solitude It's the time I put in my, my earbuds and I'm just, I'm with me and the ride on mower and I'm good for a couple of hours. All right, cool. I get it. But for the most part, I mean, you asked me to cut the lawn and I'm going to say, yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> nope. Mm-mm, not worth my time. Not yeah. worth my time at not all. So this was such a powerful conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I mean, we talked about books today. We talked about how you binge on audiobooks all the time. And I'm so excited because you have written the updated forward, the new forward to my best-selling book, mm-hmm. uh, Be a Boss and Fire That Bitch. And so the new version will be available on Amazon very soon. And most importantly, the audio version of this book, which I read myself, and I know you are recording the forward for. So, you know, it's kind of that beautiful teaser for everyone to stay tuned because it is some juicy, juicy stuff. You know, there's some exclusive things in the audio version that are not in the print or Kindle version. So uh, before we wrap up, where can everyone find you? Yeah, the best place to find me, head over to connectwiththomas.com. There's no H in my name, so it's Connect with Thomas, T-O-M-A-S. That's the easiest place. Right there is basically a link that goes out to all of my social media, all of my websites, any online courses, my book, 
uh, Break Free Academy, any of that stuff is listed there. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, understanding the value of the network is why I found it so vital for me to become uh, a member of the Apex family as well, because it was like, nope, there we go. Leveraging the network and people, you know, the right people to help continue allowing this process to be easy because it's the right people in the right places with the right guidance is the easy button to massive success, impact, influence, income, all the things. Yeah, I agree. So I'm excited. I, me too. Thank you so much for having me on. This is great. You are so welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. And of course, for you listening, be sure to like, review, and subscribe on your favorite platform that you're listening to this podcast. Remember, as always, you are enough, and I will see you in the next episode.